eyes and all. <laughs> Chapter 15. Arthur was doing well. He had drunk two more doses of Rexo's medicine, and his breathing seemed normal even at night. His skin had turned tan, and his hair was bleached by the sun. On his side of the hut, he kept a collection of gifts Christopher had given him. A feather, some pretty stones, a little pocketbook made of braided reeds, a whistle. He lined these up in a row every morning, and if Margaret tried to touch one, he shrieked. Once she even heard him say the word, mine. I always knew you could talk, Artie. I knew you were just faking. He stuck out his tongue. You'll be sorry, Margaret scowled. One of these days you'll need my help. And when it happens, I'll remember the day you stuck your tongue out at me and think, no way. Arthur laughed. He knew Margaret was just scolding. Anyway, if he needed help, all he had to do was find Christopher. He and Christopher were together all day long. They ate breakfast on the flat rock near the entrance to the nest, fruit and raisin bread, and dry cereal that tasted sort of like cornflakes. Then they went for a walk. Sometimes they followed the stream that crisscrossed the meadow, and sometimes they climbed part way up the mountainside, following one trail, then another. Christopher had started a club called the Brave Explorers. He and Artie were the only members. Arthur liked Christopher a lot. He liked to pick him up and pat his smooth, silky fur, and he liked to pluck wild grapes and feed them to him one by one. If a rock was too high for Christopher to scramble over, Arthur carried him, holding him tight against his chest. When they walked through tall grass, he put Christopher up on his shoulder so that Christopher could see which way to go. Being able to pick up his friend made Arthur feel strong. They walked and walked. Arthur had never spent so much time outdoors. At home, he had a yard with a sandbox and a swing set, and sometimes in the afternoons his mom made him go out there to play. Arthur sat miserably in a lawn chair and waited for her to let him back in. Up the street, he heard children shouting to each other. They sounded happy. He wanted to play with them. Sometimes he stood by the gate, hoping they would run past and speak to him. He even tried to open the gate and get out, but his mom saw out the kitchen window. She came and led him away from the gate. I can't let you go too far, she said. What if you needed your medicine? Arthur sighed. His mom was warm, and she smelled good and she picked him up when he was tired and held him tight. Here, the only bigger, the only one bigger than him was Margaret. She was nicer than she used to be, but she didn't realize that somebody was supposed to kiss him goodnight and sing him a song before he fell asleep. His dad knew. He thought his dad would come to see them any day now. He thought his mom probably wouldn't come. She didn't like small furry animals like Christopher. They'd seen one in the alley once, and she'd screamed and pulled Arthur in the other direction. What are you thinking? Christopher grinned at Artie and settled himself on a cozy patch of moss. Sunlight streamed through the trees, and a chickadee twittered at them from a nearby bramble. Arthur sat down, too. He hugged his knees to his chest and thought about what he would have liked to say. He opened his mouth. Hungry! I thought so. Christopher divided a packet of dried corn and handed Arthur some wild grapes. <clears throat> that ought to hold you for a while. They ate in silence. When he was done, Christopher lay back and let his full belly poke up into the air. Did I tell you I always wanted a little brother? I told my mom, but she said I was enough for her to handle. And if there were two of us, she didn't know what she'd do. My dad agreed with her, so I played a lot with my friends' little brothers. I teach them all kinds of stuff, like how to say the alphabet and where the best berries grow and how to make a ball out of hickory nut. Christopher trailed off. He rolled onto his side and let his limbs stretch out on the soft moss. There's so much I still have to learn about you, Artie, like who your human friends are and what you like to play with, stuff like that. And there's a lot here you haven't seen yet. In the fall, the valley is beautiful. 
The leaves are red and orange and yellow, and we spend all day in the woods picking up hazelnuts and chinquapins and walnuts to store over the winter. For lunch, we make a fire and roast some of the nuts we found. And winter, winter's the best time of all. It snows and we go sledding on the mountainside and skating on Emerald Pond. Isabella makes big pots of soup and for dessert, she makes ice cream out of snow. Sometimes when it's really cold, we stay inside all day, reading and doing experiments. Arthur noticed that Christopher had stopped talking. He looked worried. <clears throat> You're kind of big to come inside, he murmured, getting up. But I'll figure something out. Arthur felt uneasy. He knew Christopher had been unhappy the night he left the faucet on. And the day he tried to cross the stream on the rat's wooden bridge hadn't been a good day for Christopher either. The bridge had shattered into bits, and Christopher had tried to fix it, but he couldn't. And the old rat had come, the one who wore a patch over one eye. He'd said something to Christopher that Arthur couldn't hear. Another day, Arthur had stepped on some of the broccoli by mistake. He was really sorry after it happened. He wanted to explain that broccoli looked different at home. It was little green bits lying on a plate instead of standing up in a garden, but he couldn't figure out the words to say. Arthur trotted down the path behind Christopher. A chickadee flew out of the thicket and landed on the mossy patch to search for crumbs. Everything will work out just fine, Christopher continued. I'm a great problem solver. Believe you me. If you think there is a problem, that is. He sighed glanced at Arthur and put on a bright smile. It's almost time for another meeting of the Brave Explore, Explorers Club, Christopher, President, Artie, Vice President. We'll meet at the Flat Rock just by the bend in the stream. The meeting's at three o'clock sharp. Hurry, we have to get there in time. Chapter 16. Over here, Margaret murmured. Over here, Leon. She shifted on her bed of pine needles, then hugged her arms close for warmth. Leon was looking in the wrong place. When she spoke, he turned his head. She could see his thin brown face, his heavy glasses, his sharp eyes. He was so close she could almost touch him. Here, she murmured again. Then she woke up. It was still dark. She moved her head close to the door and lay on her back, looking up. The stars were strewn across the sky like flowers. She could pick out the North Star. Raxo had shown her that. And the bright one on the east would be Venus, the evening star. When she was little, she used to say a rhyme about it. Star light, star bright, first star I see tonight. Wish I may, I wish I might. Have the wish I wish tonight. What is my wish? Margaret sighed. Where do I want to be and who? Do I want to be with Leon going to school and having fun? Do I want to be with mom and dad in my own house? Do I want to be here living in the hut with Artie? And what if I want all those things? Ooh, ooh. The voice drifted from someplace high in the mountain. <clears throat> I don't know who Mr. Al Margaret thought wearily. She crawled back to her bed and fell asleep. In the end, she decided without really thinking it through. But first, there were more days. Days of digging up the sweet potato crop. Days of harvesting wild grapes, mashing them, straining them, boiling the juice to make grape jelly. While she was working with Isabella, Margaret asked about the winter. What will you do for food? And how will you keep warm? We have wood to burn, of course. In fact, we'll probably start cutting more next week. We keep some from the past year to start the green logs. Green, fresh cut. It burns hotter and longer, but it's hard to get going. Won't you run out of trees? We plant more each spring. Pines and hardwoods, oak, locusts and hickory. That way we'll always have a supply. And as for food, 
That's why we're making this jelly. We'll end up with enough to last all winter. But you can't just eat jelly. We'll have potatoes, cabbages, apples, turnips, carrots, and onions in the cold cellar. We'll grind more flour in October, and we'll harvest the honey then too. We'll, uh, we'll dry apples and persimmons and beans inside their pods. You've got it all figured out. I mean, you know exactly what you need and when you'll harvest it. Margaret couldn't keep the surprise out of her voice. Of course, Isabella was starting to get impatient, except that you two will probably eat us out of house and home this winter. Arthur seems to eat more every day. That was true. Margaret had noticed that he was growing, not just taller, but rounder, too. She mentioned it to Christopher, and he seemed pleased. That just shows that this is the right place for Artie. I know how to take care of him better than anybody else. You don't take better care of him than my mom. Margaret was surprised at the vehemence in her voice. My mom did everything for Artie. She spent all day taking him to the doctors and the hospital for tests. I spend all day playing with him. That's what he likes. Well, how are you going to take care of him when it gets cold? Where is he going to live then? The questions hung in the air like something visible. Margaret shivered. She hadn't dared ask the questions about herself, but Artie was different. She had to take care of Artie. He was her brother. Christopher looked scared, but his voice was calm. I have a plan. Believe me, everything will work out fine. Everything will work out fine. Margaret repeated the phrase over and over as she labored in the wheat field, cutting the tall stalks with a primitive stone blade. The rhythm of the work was soothing. Bend and stroke. Bend and stroke. A team of rats followed her, tying the wheat into bundles. Another team loaded the bundles onto a wood sledge, which was drawn back to the nest when it was full. Before she had come, it had taken ten rats, harnessed together to pull the heavy sledge, but for Margaret, it was easy. Harvest was a wonderful time. Each day, groups of rats set out in different directions, their tools and baskets on their backs, at sunset, they came back, bringing containers filled with nuts, apples, acorns, berries, herbs, and vegetables. The wheat was threshed on flat stones beside the creek. Sugar beets were ground into a fine sweet paste, and corn was shucked and hung in rows to dry. Raxo supervised the making of peanut butter. Christopher and Arthur helped him shell the peanuts and put them in a hopper to be ground by stones that rubbed against each other. Arthur liked turning the crank and watching the wet, thick peanut butter come oozing out the chute. But one time he forgot to stop turning when Raxo was adding more peanuts. Raxo's paw got caught in the hopper. When he pulled it out, it was bleeding. Ah! Run! Get the Vira, quick! He held the hurt paw tight to his belly. Someone had run for the doctor. Other rats hurried from everywhere. What happened? Raxo couldn't answer. Christopher stood beside him, trying to help. What happened, Christopher? Isabella was there now, and here came Elvira, scurrying up the path with her bag full of medicine and bandages. It was an accident, Christopher said miserably. He didn't look at Arthur, who was sitting quietly on the ground. <clears throat> but how did it happen? He got his paw caught in the grinder. But someone must have been turning the crank. The wet stones couldn't hurt you unless they were turning, and they don't turn unless someone is turning the... Me did it, Arthur said in a lonely voice. Everyone stared. Even Raxo turned and looked at Arthur. It was the first time most of the rats had heard him speak. Me sorry. Arthur said. He got up slowly. I'm sure it'll be okay, Artie, Christopher said quickly. We all know it was an accident.
Carelessness can cause terrible injuries, Elvira said. Her head was bent over Raxo's paw. This one will take a couple of weeks to heal, but it could have been worse. Oh, oh! Arthur walked away toward the pond. He started to cry. He wanted his mother to pick him up. It was an accident, Christopher said. I was watching him, but I didn't realize he was going to stop. He wasn't going to stop. I thought he knew. The other rats looked at him. I'd better go after him, Christopher said. He did want to be with Arthur, but he also wanted to get away from Raxo and the rest of the rats. He ran toward the pond. He found Artie sitting on the bank, sobbing. You didn't mean to do it, Christopher said. But Arthur couldn't stop crying. Even the feel of warm fur against his face wasn't enough. He had hurt Raxo. He was scared and confused and sorry. Most of all, he wanted his mother. Margaret was in the wheat field when the accident happened. No one told her. She kept working to the rhythm of her body. Bend and stroke, bend and stroke. Behind her, she heard Brendan and Sally chatting as they tied up the bundles. She heard the skidding of the sledge across the stubble of wheat and the voices of the loaders. Five o'clock, someone called. She looked around. All but a small crescent of wheat had been cut. The sun was even with the crest of the mountains to the west. She signaled the rats to gather around. I think we could finish this in a half hour. Brendan looked surprised. We've put in a long day already. <clears throat> but to bring all the equipment out here tomorrow for a half hour's work doesn't seem worth it. She's right, somebody said. If we finish tomorrow, if we finish tonight, we can start something else tomorrow. Okay. The rats went back to their places and Margaret to her rhythm, bend and stroke. The wheat made a soft swish as it fell. The western sky was pink and getting pinker. She moved easily. By now, she was good at what she was doing. She imagined saying to Leon, I cut a field of wheat. He'd think she was making it up, and he would laugh. She missed him badly, and her parents too. Yet right now, with the sunset blooming to her left, the wheat falling softly, her body moving gracefully, the breeze drying the sweat on her arms and neck, she was happy. She found out about Arthur when she got back. The rat who told her was reassuring. Raxo will have complete use of the paw when it's healed, and it should be as good as new in a month. She didn't blame Artie. He was just a little kid. In fact, he'd helped more in the valley than ever before. At home, he used to sit around whining while everyone else did all the work. But here he'd become, she searched for the right word, alive. Now he wanted to help. Still, He'd hurt Raxo, and that was on top of breaking the rat's bridge and flooding the inside of their nest. She shivered. Her arms were covered with goosebumps. The evenings were getting colder. Last night, she'd woken up in the dark, shivering. But these goosebumps, were they from cold or fear? I'll have to talk to Nicodemus, she thought. The wheat field is all done, so... I can go to him in the morning. He looked as if he were expecting her. He was sitting on a stool in the pine grove, holding a piece of paper in his paw. He smiled as she drew near. I hear you all finished the wheat yesterday, and that you were the one who talked the rest of them into it. She nodded, surprised that he knew. You've become someone whom the others listen to. She felt a red flush creeping toward her face. I have changed. I guess I never had to take care of things before. In a way, I was like my parents' guest, just expecting them to take care of everything. And Artie was too. Like a guest? She nodded. Like a sick guest. You went to school, 
That must have been different. She thought about it. Not really. I did enough work to pass, but mostly I goofed off with my friend, Leon. He'd come up with all sorts of crazy ideas. Crazy ideas account for the advance of civilization. Galileo, Copernicus, Lister, Madame Curie, all crazy. How do you know about them? It was Nicodemus's turn to look embarrassed. Sometimes I forget I haven't told you our history. I'll have to do that one day. The silence between them was peaceful, and for a few moments Margaret didn't even think about the reason she'd come to see Nicodemus. She was about to bring up the subject of Artie when she noticed that the paper in Nicodemus's paw was a letter. So someone else did know about the rats. She couldn't keep from staring at it. Yes, it is a letter. Nicodemus answered the silent question. It's from a friend of mine, Timothy Frisby. It's about you and Arthur. What does it say? It says... Nicodemus glanced at Margaret, then picked the letter up and read. The missing children have been declared dead. A funeral service was held for them last week. Their parents... No! Margaret gasped, her mother's face. Her fathers flashed before her. They were filled with grief. We're going home, she said. I don't care how long it takes or how far we have to walk. We're going home.